I had a great pleasure this morning of introducing our opening speaker for this symposium, John Colvin. John is an executive professor at Cultural Policy and Management at City University of London. He's also an associate and the former head of the Culture Division at the think tank Demos in the UK. Demos um, characterizes itself as the think tank for everyday democracy and a greenhouse for new ideas. Demos has been the source of a number of very important publications that have been very influential for researchers, practitioners, policymakers in the arts, um, particularly in shaping the dialogue on a number of important issues, reminding us that the foundations of the arts are expressive lives, talking about cultural democracy and democratic culture, and cultural value. John Holden has been the author of a number of these studies, and um, he has been a very key advocate for among other ideas, reminding us about the public, which is at the foundation of when we talk about the arts and the public, uh, as a public good and public value, to remind us that the public is a key part there, and also to um, remind us that culture is a very essential part of public policy in general. It is an integral and essential part of civil society, as John has said. So we're delighted he's here today. He is um, here to set the stage for us in the conversations that will follow throughout the day. Um, he's giving a talk um, to start framing our first panel of this day, which is Valuing Culture in the Global City. So please welcome me in joining John Holden. I'd like to start off really by thanking the NEA and the city and the university for bringing me um, here today. I was reminded that the last time I talked about culture in cities was not that long ago in a North American city, um, but it was to a kind of private supper club of all the movers and shakers in the town. And I got there and I was sitting next to a grand matriarch from this uh, particular place. And she said to me, um, we had a great speaker last month, which was very encouraging. So I, so I said, well, who was that? She fixed me with a very beady eye and she said, Go Vidal. <laughs> so that kind of raised, raised the bar, but I guess in coming to um, President Obama's hometown of Chicago, the bar is set pretty high here, but I will do my, I will do my best nonetheless. Um, I was really delighted to be asked to talk about this subject, valuing culture in the global city, because I think it's a, a very, very important one these days. One reason for that is that the world is getting much more urbanized than it was. In fact, it's in the very recent past, in just in 2008, the proportion of the world's population living in cities passed the 50% mark. China's gone from having 18% of its population in cities in 1978 to half of its people today. And here in the US, there are about 80% of the citizens live in cities. So even if you're not in a city, you probably get a lot of your entertainment, your news, even your value systems from what goes on inside cities. So it looks like we have an incre increasingly urbanized future. Second reason why I think um, this is an interesting question is because I find the notion of culture in cities a bit of a conundrum. When I look at lists of the world's most livable cities that appear in magazines and the media, like uh, this one in Monocle magazine, I'm struck by the fact that these are usually places that I don't want to be, in spite of the fact that they might have absolutely wonderful cultural infrastructure. You know, Fukuoka, number 17, Portland, number 21, they're delightful places, but, you know, they're not London and New York, which are not in this list of livable places. Another thing about culture in cities is that some cities which are very, very rich in the cultures of the past, um, like Kyoto and Florence, they, they might be very nice places, but they just can't, they don't cut it as pumping, happening global cities. And on top of that, you've got the fact that the heart of many of these global cities, the financial districts, of even the most, world's most prosperous cities are probably the dullest places in the entire world. Wall Street and City of London are, are just awful places to be from a cultural point of view, with the exception of uh, the Barbican in the City of London. So for me, I think how you should think about a successful cultural 
global city, uh, places that have some kind of congruence of cultural and commercial activity right here and right now. They combine the making of meaning with the making of money in interesting ways. And when I talk about the making of money, I'm not talking about hedge funds and investment banks. I'm talking about the kind of prosperity that leads to optimism. And that can come from opening a restaurant in Havana or a stall in the streets of Kinshasa as much as it can from the trading floors of the, the big uh, global cities. So these are cities that people really want to move to, places where history and news are made and where living artists thrive. These are places that get drawn and painted that surprise and confound in real time. And very often, they're not entirely comfortable. If you want me to name the names of the places that I'm talking about, I'd say places like Berlin, Istanbul, and London would be top of my list. There's another interesting thing about this question of culture and cities, and that's that in the West, the role of the traditional arts in the life of the city seems to be changing. In the 19th and 20th centuries, any city that had any pretensions and ambitions um, wanted to host a world-class museum, an orchestra, and maybe an opera house even. Here's the one in uh, Central City, Colorado, and here's another one in Manaus in Brazil. But today, by contrast, some of those traditional arts institutions are in crisis in American cities, and they're under threat in parts of Europe. And the reason for that is because the importance of the arts in the life of the city is no longer an unquestioned given. Politicians and private philanthropists everywhere are asking some difficult questions. What value do the arts and culture provide to the place where I live? Does it matter if the traditional arts disappear? And there are equally important questions that city politicians must ask of themselves. How should they react to changes that are going on in arts funding patterns? What responsibilities do they have in relation to culture? How can they optimize the regulatory and fiscal tools that they have at their disposal? Now, answering those questions is made more difficult than it otherwise would be because collectively we are in a muddle about some of the important terms in the debate, especially the words culture and value. We no longer have a shared understanding about what those things mean. And we're also troubled about the metrics of culture. How do we measure and compare across the arts landscape and beyond it into other areas of policy? So that's the starting point for my talk this morning. What I want to try to do is to provide a simple conceptual framework that will help us talk about the role of the arts and culture in the city during the rest of the day. After that, I'm going to argue that a city without the arts is doomed to economic, social, and political failure. And I will then suggest some approaches that cities should take when it comes to culture. And I've got to do all that in something under half an hour, so I'd better get on with it. So let's begin with this man, Cambridge academic Raymond Williams. In 1976, he wrote that culture was one of the two or three most difficult words in the English language. Now, back then, culture essentially had two meanings, and most people still think about culture in this way. On the one hand, culture meant the arts, an established canon of opera, ballet, poetry, etc., each of which contained its own hierarchies. Now, the arts were only enjoyed by a small part of society, one that was also, generally speaking, well-educated and rich. And this social elite defined itself not just through money and education, but through the very act of appreciating the arts. And that's why the arts then came to be labeled as elitist. So that was one meaning of culture. But there was another one, a more anthropological meaning that extended to include everything that we did to express and understand ourselves as individuals within a group, from cooking to sports to dancing to watching TV. The problem was, and still is, that those two meanings of culture, of the same word, are oppositional. Culture in the sense of the arts and popular culture were mutually exclusive. One was high, the other was low. One was refined, the other debased. 
As an individual, you could aspire to high culture, but by definition, high culture could never be adopted by everyone. It was a logical impossibility. If everyone adopted it, it was popular culture. And to invert the logic, if under this old model, popular culture was popular, that meant the arts must be unpopular. Oh dear. But don't despair, because this old model, either or model of culture, that a lot of people still cling to, I think is now redundant. The meaning of culture has to be radically rethought, because two things have happened. The first is an obvious one, and that is that the old notion that somehow particular forms of culture are inherently better than others, by which I mean that they are more capable of bearing intense meaning, that idea has been untenable for quite some time. In fact, it became crystal clear in the 1960s that the best cultural responses to the Vietnam War came not from the opera house or from literature. Instead, they came from journalism, film, and rock music. And the apotheosis, of course, was on the stage of Woodstock. So the question is no longer, is theater better than TV? Or is ballet better than street dance? Instead, the debate about cultural quality moves to niches. Is that a good Otello? Is this a great TV program? How do these jazz musicians rate? And so on. So that's the first reason why we have to rethink the relationship between arts and the rest of culture. The second imperative for a rethink flows from a much more recent and much more fundamental shift in the way that the cultural system works. Let me explain what I mean. My contention is that now, for practical purposes, we no longer have the arts and the rest of culture. Instead, there are three deeply interrelated spheres of culture. Culture which is funded, commercial culture, and homemade culture. Unlike the old high art and popular art division, these are not separate or oppositional. Instead, they're just completely intertwined. However, they are different from each other in important ways. Funded culture is the type of culture that needs support from governments or from philanthropists. This type of culture is defined not through theory, but actually it's defined through practice. What gets funding becomes culture in this sense. And therefore, who makes these decisions about what to fund, how those decisions are made, the transparency of those decisions, who gets to define this type of culture, this is a matter of considerable public interest. How a society decides to allocate the power to make those funding decisions, whether they should be taken in the boardrooms of corporations or by national or city politicians who are accountable through the ballot box or by arm's length expert agencies, all of these are really intensely political questions. The next type of culture, commercial culture, is equally pragmatically defined. The consumer is the ultimate arbiter, and if somebody thinks there's a chance that a song or a show will sell, it will get produced. Success or failure is ultimately market-driven, clearly. But crucially, your access to the market, that elusive big bucks record deal that Bruce Springsteen sings about in Rosalita, or your debut on the stage, or the publication of your first novel, these are controlled by a corporate elite who are just as powerful as the arbiters of funded culture. The really important thing to grasp here is that both in funded culture and in commercial culture, there are gatekeepers who define the meaning of culture through their decisions. In both cases, if you're an artist, you have to overcome an obstacle in order to get your work in front of an audience. But in the third sphere of culture, homemade culture, this is not the case. Homemade culture extends from the historic objects and activities of folk art through to the postmodern punk garage band and the YouTube upload. And here, the definition of what counts as culture is much broader. It's defined by an informal, self-selecting peer group, and the barriers to entry are much lower. Singing in a choir, writing a song, posting it on Facebook, all these might take a great deal of technical skill, but they can actually be done independently and without much difficulty. And the decision about the quality of what's produced then lies in the hands not of an expert, but of those who see here taste the finished article. So culture, in this sense, gets democratized. 
In the past 30 years, we've seen an explosion of activity in this third space of homemade culture. It was always there, but it has really mushroomed. How many 20-year-olds do you know who are in a band or curate their own photographs or make films with their camcorders? Pretty much 100% of the ones that I know. Everyone under the age of 25 seems to be an aspirant, musician, poet, writer, or filmmaker. In part, that's because the means of production have become cheaper and easier to use. You can now make a film on a $200 camera and edit it on a laptop instead of needing a crew of 50 unionized workers and a capital-intensive studio. But the really revolutionary technical, technological innovation has been the internet. What the internet has done uniquely and irrevocably and in an incredibly short space of time is to enable people to use culture to communicate, to collaborate, and to make money in ways that are entirely new. This has created havoc with the business models of much of the commercial sector in music, film, and broadcasting. And it's changed the possibilities for all three of those spheres of culture and all forms of cultural expression within them because it presents a wealth of new opportunities, such as new audiences, developing new art forms, creating new distribution channels, but it also raises a whole new set of questions. What to do about intellectual property, what to fund, how to educate young people for this new world, censorship. By fundamentally changing the rules of the game, this revolutionary technology has also changed the role of culture in people's lives. Instead of being passive consumers of culture, dumb audience members sitting in the dark in silence. Nowadays, we all take on positions as producers, consumers, authors, readers, performers, spectators, all of the time. We graze in comfort now across these three spheres of culture without a second thought. Each of us moves fluidly between uh, these sectors, creating our sense of individual and collective identity as we go. And we increasingly define ourselves by what we choose to watch, choose to listen to, choose to read, and so on. And just as this integrated model of culture explains how and why the arts and culture together have become more important for individual people, by extension, it explains why this big cultural landscape has become much more important to cities, and why culture will, I think, become more and more important in the worlds of politics and public policy. Because under the old model of culture, the arts could be dismissed as a narrow, elitist pursuit. Commercial culture could be written off as mere populist entertainment. And homemade culture could be patronized as being amateur. But if you put all three of them together into one completely interlinked and interwoven activity, then culture transforms into being what Jordi Marti, who is the head of culture in Barcelona, what he calls the second ecosystem of humankind. Now, if all that sounds too highfalutin and theoretical, let me present you with some of the reality of how culture today affects the life of cities and nations. First of all, this broad sweep of interconnected culture has become economically important. In a publication I wrote a few years ago for the Arts Council in England, I looked at the ways in which the funded and the money-making cultural industries were inseparable because of the way that ideas and skills are shared, because of the way that one creates a market for the other, and because of the way that people make a living by operating right across this landscape. A couple of examples. This is Ian McKellen appearing in Lord of the Rings and classically trained at the Royal Shakespeare Company. This is an advert that relies on visual language learned from the fine arts. This TV advert has a backing track of Dvorak's New World Symphony played by the publicly funded Halle Orchestra. And on and on and on these connections go. My point here is that the so-called high arts are not divorced from the economy of the rest of the creative industries. They are an absolutely essential part of it. And together they form a really significant sector of the economy. Where I come from in the UK, the creative sector accounts for around 7% of GDP. That's a lot of money and a lot of jobs. And the, that money and those jobs are concentrated in cities. 
In most OECD countries at the moment, this is one of the very few parts of the economy that's significantly outperforming the rest. But rather than thinking of it as an economic sector, I think we should be thinking of it as an economic system. And like all systems, it needs all of its parts in order to function. Take away the arts, and you won't be left with much else. Second area of economic growth is the cultural-led tourism, which is why you can see cities from Abu Dhabi to Aporto and from Hong Kong to Sydney investing heavily in new cultural buildings. And then there's urban regeneration, where culture has refreshed parts of cities and led to huge increases in property values and improvements in social life as well. Now, I know other speakers will be talking a lot later about these economic factors, so I don't want to go into any further detail. Suffice to say that cities all around the world have realized the importance not only of the creative economy itself and the jobs it creates, but also the knock-on effects of cultural activity as an attractor of a highly educated workforce for other, se other sectors. In many cities, smart public sector investment is driving private sector prosperity, just as it always has done. But here's an important point. We're all familiar with the idea that physical infrastructure, such as roads and water pipes, are an essential component of building a city. We can, by extension, get our heads around the need for physical cultural infrastructure, like museums and concert halls. What is less familiar, but now equally important, is the idea of investing in the less visible infrastructure of cultural connectivity. The Harvard economist Edward Glesser says in his book, Triumph of the City, that what thriving cities do is attract brilliant people and then connect them. It's interconnection that nurtures and develops human capital. Cities need to constantly form new connections to regenerate and renew themselves. They need stimulus, they need diversity. That's why port cities like Venice and San Francisco have historically succeeded, whereas single industry towns that have lost their connectivity, like Detroit and Liverpool, have failed. And this is another reason why cultural life is so important, because not only does the cultural world provide essential social spaces where interconnection takes place, it's also the case that what happens in those spaces creates the norms of the behavior that builds social capital. In turn, social capital underpins the relationships that make a city and its economy function and thrive. And on top of that, of course, cultural life provides many of the stimuli that prompt social connectivity to become creative and fruitful in the first place. What then are the implications of all that for cities? Well, first, I think we need a shift in our mindset away from city governments thinking of themselves as providing or delivering culture. I've explained how the entry costs to self-expression have been lowered and that we now have an observable phenomenon of mass engagement with all sorts of different types of culture. The job of the city is to enable people to be part of that, to increase their opportunities for enjoying themselves, to improve their ability to learn from the cultures of the past and the present, and to give them the tools and the confidence to create the culture of the present and the future. This involves not just providing the built infrastructure of culture, the symphony halls, the theaters, the galleries, the bars that host live music and the cinemas, but it also means paying attention to the capacity of people to use those places. In turn, that means looking at things like the education system, how the transport network and planning decisions support cultural activity. It means taking an interest in how cultural organizations treat both citizens and visitors. It means asking hard questions about who has a cultural voice and who gets a say in the development of the culture of the city. In other words, it's a lot more complex and wide-ranging than it used to be. But it's also potentially much more rewarding. Get this right, and the city will flourish socially and economically. Get it wrong, and it's likely that the city will fail. I want to spend a little time now just looking at the ideas of how we might articulate and measure some of what I've been talking about. If, as I've been claiming, culture is so important to the life of the city, then how do we get a handle on the value of that culture? Before I do that, just let me recap the argument so far so that you can see where we've got to. What I've been arguing is, first, that we need to reframe the arts as an essential part of a broader concept of culture. 
Second, that cultural life has been transformed over a very short space of time from something that was marginal into something that has become hugely important for our personal and community identity, as well as being of significant and growing importance economically. Third, I've maintained that a successful global city needs to understand these trends and changes and then needs to construct the physical, regulatory, fiscal environments that will nurture a rich cultural life for its citizens. That in turn means paying attention to things that used to be considered outside the remit of cultural decisions. Finally, I've said that I think cities neglect the arts and culture at their peril. And the price of failure is high, not just economically, but also in terms of human development, human fulfillment. But I understand that in policy and political terms, the arts and culture are actually very difficult to deal with. They often seem to be simultaneously soft and fluffy and slippery. Now, I have in the past put forward this simple diagram to try to articulate the different values that culture can have to different groups in society. Put briefly, the argument is this, that you can look at the value of culture in three ways, using different sorts of language in each case. These three viewpoints are not mutually exclusive. On the contrary, they are entirely complementary. But depending on who you are, they are more or less important. Let me explain what I mean. At the top of the triangle is intrinsic value. Now, the word intrinsic, the dictionary definition, is that it means integral to, an essential part of. So this implies that museums, dance, theatre and so on have a value in themselves. Each of our art forms provides a unique way of communicating that would be lost if they didn't exist. And that fact alone establishes the arts as a public good in their own right. We should value dance because it is dance and poetry, uh, and, and poetry because it is poetry, and not just because dance and poetry have economic and social impacts. But the term intrinsic value is also used to describe the way that art forms have individual subjective effects on each of us. Intrinsic value is what people are talking about when they say, I love to dance, or that painting's rubbish, or I need to write poetry to express myself. Now, this type of value, intrinsic value, is notoriously difficult to describe, let alone to measure. And the rational econometrics of government simply can't cope with it, because this aspect of culture deals in abstract concepts like fun, beauty, the sublime, the spiritual. It affects our emotions individually and differently, and it involves making judgments about quality. It really doesn't fit with the hard-headed machismo that's supposed to dominate in business, politics, sport, and the media. These days, if you can't count it, it doesn't count. But how on earth do you put a number on something like that? Elifor Eliasson's weather project in Tate Modern. This is important because to you or me, as an individual, it's our own subjective response to culture that really matters. When I sit in a darkened auditorium listening, for example, to um, Benjamin Britten, my feelings are awakened. I think, this is lovely. It's amazing. It's astonishing. I don't sit there thinking, I'm so glad this performance is driving business prosperity and helping to create jobs in the greater Chicago area. So if we're talking about the value of culture to individuals, we really need to talk about quality, excellence, physical intellectual access, audience demographics, who's enjoying this stuff, who has a voice in it. We need to take qualitative factors into account to argue about what is good and bad art, what excellence means, how audience experiences can be improved. And we can only have those debates through narrative and language. Numbers can provide a proxy for some of it, but it can never give us the total pic picture. It's important to realize, I think, when we talk about intrinsic value that we're talking, we're using value as an active verb. I value something, you value something, we value something. And that process of valuation is subjective. You can tell me that a painting is good and try to explain why you think so. You can give me the statistics that show me how dancing will benefit my health in all sorts of ways, but only I can value that painting or the dance. This, I think, is a crucial point. 
because when we turn to the next type of value, instrumental value, we're dealing with an objective concept. So here we have to think about value slightly differently. Instrumental value is used to describe instances where culture is used as a tool or an instrument to accomplish some other aim. An aim such as economic regeneration or improved exam results or better patient recovery times. These are the knock-on effects, the things that happen in the world as a result of culture. Looking to achieve things that could actually be achieved in other ways as well. Now this type of value has been of tremendous interest to funders over the last 30 years or so. And at some points, it has become so overwhelmingly important, certainly where I come from with the public funding from the UK government, it's become so overwhelmingly important that the other values of culture have been forgotten. There are perfectly understandable reasons why that's been the case. One of them is that funders need to take decisions between com competing demands on their money. So they want to find objective measures that quantify the effects of their investment. Instrumental values provide just those sort of metrics. They take a start point and an end point and measure the change in between. They are therefore important, but they don't tell the whole story. A full account of cultural value needs to talk about both the subjective individual experience of culture, in other words, intrinsic value, and the objective measurable benefits that culture produces, instrumental value. But there's something else as well that needs to be discussed. And I call this institutional value. This is all about the way that cultural organizations act. Cultural organizations are part of the public realm. They are open to the public and welcome the public. And so how they do things creates value just as much as what they do. In their interactions with the public, cultural organizations are in a position to increase or indeed to decrease such things as our trust in each other, our idea of whether we live in a fair and equitable society, our mutual conviviality, our civility, and a whole host of other public goods. And it is these public goods, these human interactions, that make cities work. So the way in which our institutions go about their business is really important. Things like opening hours, meeting and greeting, providing opportunities to grow and to learn, these are not simply about customer care as they would be in the commercial world. No, they're actually much, much more important than that because they can act to strengthen our sense of nationhood and our attachment to our locality and our community. So institutional value exists as the social dimension of culture and its social utility can take many forms. For example, culture enables a range of democratic voices to be heard. Particular cultural events can either challenge or support the status quo. Either way, they provide an important democratic space through which our society develops. The question is, how do you count this institutional value? Well, here in contrast to instrumental value, where you're trying to find out the objective measurable benefits of culture, here what you want to do is find out the value that people collectively place on culture. And so you must ask them. You ask them what they think through surveys, through focus groups, and through contingent valuation techniques. But to sum up our value triangle, you can see that these three ways in which culture can be valued intrinsically, instrumentally, institutionally. I want to stress that these are not three distinct categories where we put different experiences or art forms. It's not that contemporary dance is all about intrinsic value and theater is all about institutional value. My point is that all these three values are viewpoints or perspectives that have equal validity and you have to consider them all together if you want to have a full understanding of what's going on. Seeing all three values as essential aspects of culture or as equal viewpoints avoids both the dangerous predominance of any one of them and the dangerous reductivism inherent in looking at culture through only one academic discipline, whatever that might be. Taken together, these three ways of valuing culture provide cities with a set of hard and soft, qualitative and quantitative methodologies to articulate the value of culture to their citizens. And once that's in place, politicians, funders, and arts organizations have shared terms of reference and then can then have a debate about investment, infrastructure, education, and a host of other issues. And that debate 
should not be directed to providing a settled culture to the citizens of the city. Rather, it is directed towards enabling those citizens to live a full and rich cultural life where they understand both the culture of the past and the global cultures of the present, but where they can also create their own culture today and tomorrow. Let me finish by showing you two pictures. They were painted around 1339, 1340 on the walls of the uh, Palazzo Publico in Siena in Italy by Ambrogio Lorenzetti. And they show allegories of the good and the bad city, the result of good and bad government. Bad government is typified by crumbling buildings, poor infrastructure, people fighting each other, scarcity. There's smoke and famine. By contrast, good government looks exactly like what I've been talking about, a prosperous place where singing and dancing are an important part of life. It's a beautiful vision, and it's as true now as it was 700 years ago. So let's do all that we can to make it a reality for everyone in the global city of today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for uh, blowing these issues wide open for all of us. Uh, it's a very exciting way to start the, uh, the, the, the conference. Um, before I begin, I just want to also, uh, I'm Sunil Iyengar, Director of Research and Analysis for the National Endowment for the Arts. And as you know, of course, as Joan has mentioned, uh, the NEA is a proud partner uh, with the University of Chicago for this event. And we're proud not only because of the top-notch quality of today's speakers and the variety of topics we'll be addressing, but because this conference and this panel um, particularly uh, speak to a new priority goal for the Arts Endowment um, in service of the public. Uh, specifically, the title of the panel, Valuing Culture in the Global City, and the very concepts you heard John speak about just now neatly align with the NEA's recent focus on expanding and promoting evidence of the value and impact of the arts for all Americans, especially with regard to individual quality of life and the livability of communities. I'll introduce my uh, very distinguished panelists in just a moment, um, but I also wanted to thank Michelle Olson, uh, Director of Office of Civic Engagement. Um, the work that you've seen here um, is has been at the forefront. Thank you. <laughs> the work, the work here has been at the forefront uh, that, that John described, and, and the questions we're about to raise are really at the forefront of uh, several new research projects, as Joan mentioned, uh, that have been commissioned by the NEA. And I thought I'd just mention a couple of them uh, before going forward with our line of questioning for John and his colleagues. Um, one, one example is this report on creative placemaking, uh, which is out in the front, and there's also a list of NEA research publications. Uh, that are all available on the arts.gov slash research website. Um, and many of them, in fact, do uh, attempt to quantify uh, cultural value in various ways. Um, there's also a study, for example, on outdoor festivals and communities, which talks about uh, this connectivity idea that we talked about. And lastly, I wanted to note that the NEA is embarking on a large-scale effort, the first of its kind for the agency, to understand and measure the arts in the US as a complex system. Uh, to map its nodes and networks so we can design a hypothesis for how the arts in American life translate into vivid outcomes and impacts on other domains, uh, whether creativity and innovation, health and wellness, education and lifelong learning, civic engagement, global competitiveness, or economic prosperity, to name some examples. The ultimate goal is to track those outcomes and impacts over time, and as a first step in this direction, we issued a call for proposals in this area as of late last week. So with all that, you can see why I'm thrilled to moderate a session that will consider the points that John Holden has made about valuing culture in the global city, intrinsic, instrumental, institutional, or otherwise. Um, and so just to introduce my discussants, uh, first, um, after sitting right next to John, is a fellow Brit to make John feel less lonely, uh, Alan <laughs> Freeman, uh, principal economist of the Greater London Authority and visiting research fellow at the University of Manitoba. He was lead author for the landmark report, London, a Cultural Audit. Um, I was chatting with Alan just before this and he told me he was exploring, he's exploring the creation of an academic research network, ultimately, to uh, measure all things arts related, which is music to my ears, to say the least. Um, <laughs> next, we have Carol Coletta, director of Art Place a new uh, national initiative to accelerate creative placemaking across the country. Art Place is a collaboration of the nation's top foundations and the NEA itself. Prior to taking on this assignment, Carol was CEO for CEOs for Cities. That's a very cool title. 
Um, and for a decade, she hosted and produced a syndicated radio show, Smart City. I've enjoyed in recent months trading notes and ideas with Carol about how to employ smarter metrics to capture cultural value and the value of urban design for residents and employers. So I'm going to be asking each of these speakers a question in turn, of course, give them an opportunity to ask questions of each other before turning over to the audience at, at the end. And I see we have a little more than half an hour. So first, uh, John, my question for you. I'm just going to, if I could, uh, push back a little bit on what you said about intrinsic impact. Um, can you, you said, it seemed to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounded somewhat um, uh, emphatically, you were saying essentially that intrinsic impact is essentially, the intrinsic benefits are essentially subjective and don't lend themselves, well, we certainly know they don't lend themselves easily to measurements, but you seem to say they don't really lend themselves to quantitative measurements. And the reason I ask this is because um, when you talked about the institutional value, uh, you talked, for example, about contingent valuation and people's willingness to go to arts events, for example. And so I mean, help me understand, is that in fact, um, would you still say that um, the subjective value proposition for masses of individuals can't be measured in terms of intrinsic impact, or were you talking only about on a one-on-one -on -one kind of basis? <laughs> well, it's quite a technical question, but I, I think part of the problem is that, as, as I mentioned, I think intrinsic is used to mean several different things in the debate. If we narrow it down to just the subjective impression that people have about a particular work or a particular experience, then clearly you can ask them what they thought about that. You can ask them to score it on a score of 1 to 10 or to talk about it in terms of writing an essay about it or, or poetry, and that will help you understand. You can aggregate those and find out that you know, more people think a Leonardo drawing is a fantastic thing than, uh, than X, y, X, Y, or Z. So you can get some kind of handle on, on, on that. Yes, you can. Um, so measurement is, is not completely redundant, I think, in intrinsic value. But um, w what I think we must be careful of is not trying to get uh, some kind of proxy metric that leaves out the poetry of the situation. Right. And uh, just to follow up um, with looking at that triangle, which is, I found a very, very helpful way of understanding those three elements. Um, do you uh, see the, could you speak a little bit about where you see, in broadly speaking, the commercial sector fitting in uh, in terms of their gravitation toward one or those particular areas of uh, arts, understanding the arts? Yeah. Do you see them more on the, do they tend to cluster around the instrumental side, would you say, in terms of the way they operate? In, uh, I, I think actually they can, that um, private sector funders can have many different motivations. Um, <coughs> For pure kind of commercial sponsorship, very often they're looking for some kind of marketing advantage or uh, aligning themselves with a particular brand that will rub off well on their own uh, brand image and, and so on and so forth. So I think, um, again, it's a complicated question. Um, but their, 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 their motivations should be probed. I think that's the fundamental thing. Um, there's no easy answer to that, and it will vary from case to case. Yeah, and I have to say, um, in a lot of uh, John's work, I'm, I understand that this idea of pinpointing motivations for people's engaging with the arts and engaging with culture is, is in of itself a very valuable metric and one that's certainly been underutilized in the public arena for public funders, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, very good. Uh, and actually, Alan, um, I'd like you, if you could, just for maybe four or five minutes, say a few words about... Uh, the, the, the London Cultural Audit, which, of course, uh, for those of you who don't know, it involved international comparisons of several cities um, and, and the inventorying and the work that was undertaken to, to uh, map out what, what uh, exists by way of culture in London is, no, uh, is, is quite a heady task. And I just, if you could just say a little bit about how that came into, the process came into being and uh, what you ended up accomplishing with it. Yeah, it's a very difficult in five minutes. I, <laughs> what it is, is, uh, first of all, I'm an economist. And secondly, principal economist is uh, a job description. It's not a post. I'm just a backroom person. But a backroom person from an unusual experience, I was part of the campaign team of London's first directly elected mayor, Ken Livingston, who was elected in 2000. And um, Ken was elected without party backing, with no machine. So we went through an absolutely unique experience of, of, of building a city administration out of nothing from the ground up. And I would never want to go through it again, but I, <laughs> I'm glad I went through it. 
One of the things that the, the fiendish British did was they, London's always been the enemy of England since James II. England is scared of London because unlike Chicago, it contains one-fifth of the population of the country. So they granted a democratically elected mayor and gave him no power, no money, no budget, practically nothing. Transport, a little bit of planning permission, and that's it. And what you therefore get is something that I think is actually a common feature in many cities, which is celebrity mayorship. And the function of that is actually very real. It's because when you have no money, culture is actually one of the most vital things. And I'm astonished constantly at this atmosphere that says, we're running short of money, so we should cut the arts first. <laughs> I think you should cut the arts last, because it's the cheapest. I mean, you know, people go out and they'll play music for you on the streets. Anybody been to New Orleans will see that. You paint on your walls for nothing. Um, you ever get a plumber to come and fix your taps for free? Put him in touch with me, <laughs> right? Or, or dig out roads or whatever. And it has the most tremendous power to make people work together. And I just want to give an example of this, which is the background to the cultural audit. And it's sort of interesting. After we got the Olympics for London, 6th of July 2005, the very day that we after we'd celebrated, 56 people were killed in um, 7th of 7-7, the terrorist attack on London, four bombs went off. And this was the most tremendous issue facing the new mayor in his mayoralty. And there were many resources that one could think about which were deployed, the police, but the most important thing was what was the message that the mayor was going to put out? And there were two messages. One was, this is a city, this is what we now call a world in one city. 300 languages are spoken in London schools. There are people from every part of the world, every religion, every culture, every ethnicity are there. And that is London's strength. And the second thing, we said, we are one London. We're not going to tear ourselves apart. Acts like this have no place. And we are not going to descend into... We have a history of race riots. We have a history of great deprivation, great social opposition. But something unites us, the stronger than what divides us. Now, the cultural message there is very interesting, and I don't quite know how it fits into your triangle. It, it to me, is closer to John Hawkes' conception, where he says, well, there's actually a fourth meaning of values, which is like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These are values. These are values that you incarnate when you're active. Somehow, part of what used to be associated with patriotism, the, the celebration of what the community has in common as a large entity is being displaced to the city. People are proud to be part of cities. People are proud of what they are. And the arts are part of what they're proud of, which is why I just think it's going to be very important for Chicago and London to find a way of working together because that background of pride, of civic pride in what you are and your history and your people is phenomenally important. So what was the cultural audit? It was an attempt to make that transparent. It was an attempt to measure and lay before the participants in that the knowledge and information which would allow them to work together. Because, and this is the point, one might think that that governance strategy was instrumental. It's very subtle. It's like city branding is not instrumental. You can't hand down a brand or it goes terribly wrong, like the Delhi Commonwealth Games goes wrong. You know, brand meltdown is an awful event. It has to reflect what the city really is. So all we were doing is reflecting back at the city what the city had already achieved. And it was because people recognized that and identified with that and said, yes, this is our strength. No, we won't let people break us apart, that it worked. And the idea behind the cultural audit was to, um, I think, really broaden that, the self-knowledge of the city through the knowledge of what its arts achievements really are, without any particular, you know, methodology that, that there was a methodology, but we're, <laughs> we're starting from nothing. So we just said, let's get every single piece of data that we can and, 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 and count it, which I love because I'm, at heart, I'm a counter. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, Carol, uh, it's in a similar vein, if you, if you wouldn't mind, um, just again, taking maybe four to five minutes, in your case, to sort of explain how some of your past work, uh, both at CEOs for Cities and as a consultant, have uh, led you to believe 
because uh, you've expressed this many times to me, that arts and culture play a significant role in forming a city's identity and in attracting new talent to cities. Uh, what do you think is, where do you think is some of the best evidence we have for that from what you've seen? You know, Sunil, in terms of the work that uh, we did at CEOs for Cities, I think there are two pieces of work in particular that, that stand out for me. And, you know, I come at this discussion not as an arts advocate, although I love the arts, but not as an arts advocate, but as an advocate for successful cities. So I come at this from outside in, John, sort of the, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the ways in which um, you talk about um, your work. Um, and, and there are two pieces. I think one is something we call city vitals, where we looked at, uh, we tried to, to look at those indicators uh, and then summarize those indicators that we believed uh, made su cities successful. And there are four, talent, connections, distinctiveness, and innovation, which are all driven by uh, or accelerated by a strong core. And if you look at that, I think you can see ways in which art and culture play a role in each of those things. And some of that's been talked about already, the connections piece you talked about earlier. Um, but, and, and certainly distinctiveness. I mean, and it's, it's interesting. I was with a, about 500 people yesterday in Detroit who are all uh, working on land banks uh, in their communities. What that really means is they're all working in communities with too much land and too few people. And so they're trying to figure out how do you sort of restart the energy or the economic momentum in these cities. And you think about it, I mean, it's like, okay, I have nothing to work with, what do I work with? They looked at the variety of genres that were in them. And I mean, it was just literally bootstrapped out of existence. Mm -hmm. We are at the very frontier of measurement. I mean, mm -hmm. one of the interesting things about America is that the free enterprise culture has gone with this amazing production of information. Going, everybody who works in the field of economic statistics knows that American national income statistics are the best. They go all the way back to 1929. They're beautifully standardized and so on. We're now in a new world where we're not measuring how much electricity and how much steel and how much corn we're making. We're measuring something that doesn't like being measured. <laughs> yeah. and, um, and it tells us it doesn't like being measured. So um, I think that you need a new different way of doing planning, which is it's not handing things down. That, that's, that's got to stop, and it is stopping. Mm -hmm. It's all about engagement and consultation and um, mixing people together and getting different takes on ideas. But also you need a different conception of information. And that concept of information has to work on these amazing new ways of arisen with, with Facebook and Wikipedia of, mm -hmm. of uh, encouraging people to produce information themselves, which as Wikipedia shows you, they will do. I mean, people love providing information, but you need a framework for it. As for how you apply it, I mean, one of my, one of my favorite remarks is we live in a world still of what I call fake positivism, which is you throw lots of numbers around and people think that now they know how to do things. They don't, because there's no causal model. We don't, we don't, none of the questions I've had thrown at me as a cultural economist, I've had answers to which flow out of the numbers because nobody can tell me how it works. So I, I think those are both areas of future research and uh, this is certainly one of the places where that ought to happen and so pleased to see it is happening. Carol, do you think uh, there's coming from sort of, you have a foot in a sense in both camps. So you've got, you know, definitely the city planning, urban design experience, and, and certainly, you know, this passion for the arts and arts and culture. Uh, do you see, uh, are there lessons, tangible lessons that you think, uh, when you work with arts organizations, that you think, you know, this is something they sh you should probably know as an arts organization that you might not know, given I mean, where you're sitting and your access to understanding how city policies work and how city planning works. Um, are there, do you feel like arts has really maximized that potential uh, in various cities to engage successfully with policymakers at the city level? Or vice versa, do you see anything that maybe the city planners really should understand about the arts that haven't been articulated extremely well? In, in most cities, I think there's not a robust uh, dialogue going on between uh, elected officials and, and, and uh, policymakers and arts organizations. I think too often the discussion is all about money. Um, and, and 
that's not, you know, that doesn't provide much of a foundation for having an equal relationship, mm -hmm. uh, one where both parties are bringing something to the table. And I, I think that's, a, that's most unfortunate because I think art and culture, bring, if you bring the perspective of what can we contribute to these things that do make cities successful, and we know make cities successful, and policymakers mm -hmm. know make cities successful, I think there's actually a much more robust discussion to be had, so. Yeah, and, and in fact, that's what kind of br brought me back to the original question I had of you, uh, John, uh, which essentially, you know, all those elements seem very, very blurred, uh, and the, inst the instrumental, the intrinsic, and uh, certainly the institutional. But, but I think what they do, and, they and very... I think the real value of it, mm. is to, is, it's like the thinking hats, right? Yeah, I mean, exactly. It, it's yeah. exactly, it's like, okay, so you put this perspective on, and, and you, you view the organization and its resources in this way, yeah. and the way in which it contributes, but you, know, you, you put the other hat on, and you think of it very differently, and I think that's what makes it so rich. Mm. Well, that, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. I think because if you simply take one perspective, yeah. it, the, the system fails. If you simply take intrinsic values and reject metrics, which a lot of people in the UK yeah. did, mm -hmm. and the reason why they want to do that is so that they hold the power to say, we're good, we're doing this, mm -hmm. we don't want to measure it, we don't want it compared with anything else, leave us to our own devices. So, and if all you, know, you do is the yeah. instrumental, which is what we've been eaten up yeah. with here, you know, then you completely diminish all of the other yeah. values that uh, arts bring. And yeah. I think there's an intermediate stage, perhaps, which is turning information into knowledge. And I'll give an example of that. We had an issue that came across our table, which is about the simultaneous decline of traditional digital media. I call it traditional because, you know, CDs and so on. Um, the, the, the file downloading, the way that file downloading was impacting the music industry, which is a catastrophic downward ride. And at the same time, we had an issue about live performance because there was a proposal to close a very famous heritage venue, the Apollo in Hammersmith, which now I see as being rescued by HMV, yeah. interestingly enough. I hope on the basis of some of the data we provided because we've got some wonderful data from the people who collect royalties. And it showed that the revenue from um, the decline in revenue from file downloading was exactly matched by a rise in revenue from live performance. Mm. Now, as an economist, I understand that's a sunrise sunset industry. One form of consumption is going down. People have a certain amount of money. They allocate this to consumption or participation in the arts, and they've switched to live. So we actually were able to predict right. that right. there would be a big rise in the demand for venues of all types for venue for, for, for performance. At the same time, we were able to predict that there would be a shortfall of performers. And performers, because there's a long tail, a lot of people on very low income struggling for decades sometimes to get recognition, need the support in order to become the big star bands. And you know, a lot of what's going on now in the bridge up music scene is just the recycling of tribute bands, which is one of the proofs we offer that the young performers are not actually being encouraged. So there are two conclusions that we got. Support the performers and build the venues, and that's knowledge. But what we didn't, what we haven't got yet is the policy instruments that I think connect them up, but maybe you have. Well, that's what great, and from we, we haven't by any means forgotten the audience, so we will now, uh, let's, let's have some questions. I believe we have a roving mic. Any questions for our panelists? Just raise your hand, and I believe uh, someone will come over. If you could say your name and affiliation first, please. Uh, yes, hi. I'm, uh, my name is Jonathan Schwart. Uh, I'm a master's candidate at the, uh, at the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. Uh, and so, as a policy student, you know, we talk a lot about valuation and, uh, and I've talked and you know, I've learned a lot about uh, how valuation particularly applies to the arts and I agree that there's something that's not very satisfying about it. Um, you know, on the one hand, as a, uh, as a person that loves the arts, I see this subjective value, but then as a, as a policy uh, or an aspiring policy maker, you know, I think, well, you know, there needs to be more than it just feels good. Um, but I'm, I'm very curious to know if you have, uh, if you've looked into uh, any of the, um, the neuro, uh, neuroeconomics and sort of 
thinking about valuation in terms of, you know, the literal chemical experience within the brain. Um, <laughs> if, any of, if any of that research has, can inform, better inform our valuation of the arts uh, and, and move away from, from a model that sort of seeks to monetize it, but to, but to sort of create value, uh, sort of quantify value in a way that, uh, that is new and more informative for the arts. Let me just say one thing. I, I think the, uh, you know, the notion of happiness, and uh, there have been lots of debates about you know, the way we measure gross uh, national product and we measure negative, negative inputs become part of the gross national product. And you wonder if happiness, uh, even if you could prove that arts and culture move happiness, I wonder if it would make a bit of difference with policymakers or with elected officials. I mean, you know, I, I, just a thought. Oh, very. Well, I, I actually think that uh, my, my term du jour is uh, well-being, um, because I think there is a, a subtle difference there, and well-being connects you to uh, many cognitive and uh, social benefits that are very instrumentally measurable. Um, and so, for example, maybe rather than neuro, neural stimulus that gives one pleasure in that sense, hedonic pleasure, you can actually maybe understand cognitive growth or cognitive development, which again links straight into human development, um, which has its normal pathways for measurement. But nevertheless, I, I think that's a fascinating area. Any comments on neuroeconomics? Uh, I don't know anything about neuroeconomics, but I've started reading about neuroscience quite a lot. And, uh, it seems to me very, very interesting as, as an explanatory mechanism for what's going on, but it leads you very quickly into deep philosophical waters about free will, individual choice, autonomy, and all that kind of thing. Uh, and I hate to think of um, you know, audiences set up as lab rats with things on their skulls watching a performance of Shakespeare or, or, or something. I think you still need to have the richness of language to articulate the experience regardless of what you were seeing on a computer screen about electrical impulses. I don't know, I feel uh, probably the lab rats might be coming, but that's <laughs> just being pessimistic there. I mean, I, I can connect it, I, I think it could be very helpful to the arts. For economics, I'm a bit more worried because there's a whole branch of economics called the economics of happiness, which has emerged recently, and there are a number of problems with that, which is that I think the difficulty of using it to describe artistic experience and also sports experience is that these are inherently collective. I don't think, I mean, I don't know how many White Sox fans are there here, but, you know, I don't think when White Sox wins, the total happiness of the community can be measured by going round and interrogating every single White Sox supporter and every single White Sox opponent and adding up the misery and the happiness and coming out with the result. <laughs> it's just going to be nothing, right? Okay. Does that mean nothing has happened when White Sox win or lose? <laughs> no, something's happened. But it's collective. It's, it's, it's the community of supporters, and it's the same with the arts. Arts is an inherently collective experience. So I think the old Benthamite idea that you've got something where you just tot up the happiness of each person and misery of each person, we've got to get a little bit beyond that. Arts are inherently external. They, they generate externalities. That's why economists have such problems with them. Right. I'm just impressed you brought the white socks into it. <laughs> uh, no, that's great. Uh... Hi, I'm Janine Miley, I'm an art historian at Swarthmore College. Um, and I have a question, that there seems to be an inter um, a sort of contradiction in some of what you've all presented, which is that the newest growth area, right, is internet-based, um, as we heard. And then at the same time, we're interested in cities, right? And cities have historically prospered at modes of interconnection in physical space, and the internet is virtual. And I was interested in the last um, example that you gave of the music industry sort of gaining um, uh, public um, concert venues as, as um, buying of albums went down. And are there other, space, other examples in which the sort of virtual um, growth has led to spatial and physical um, growth? Because they seem to me to be inverse, and I'm curious about how that's working. Yeah. Did you hear Sorry. all of the question? Did you hear the question? Can, can you? I didn't yeah, hear um, yeah. So, so do you, I, I'm going to do a poor job possibly of rephrasing your question, so maybe you want to stand up just in case I fail. Um, it sounded like you were saying 
Uh, you, you want to understand how virtual space and physical space complement each other in terms of understand, having a better understanding of cultural value? Or? I see. Thanks. Oh, it's, it's hard for us to hear down here, I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, no, I see what you mean. I, I don't think they're um, contradictory at all, actually. Um, my point, I think, is that what the internet has encouraged us all to do is to... Uh, sorry, let me backtrack a bit. I've got a colleague at Demos called Charlie Leadbeater, and he says that in the arts and culture these days, we want essentially three things. We want to enjoy or talk or do. And that we've always done those three things. And there's no moral hierarchy between them. Sometimes we might sit there listening to our own record player or to a live performance. Sometimes we want it to be a social experience and to learn about it. And at other times, we will want to participate and engage with others and create our own stuff. Now, the direction of travel has been towards um, the participatory end. But it doesn't invalidate what happens in the physical social sphere at all. In fact, I think it en enriches it because the more people are doing for themselves, the more they are wanting to go and see and see what other people are doing. So I see these two things not, not as in opposition but actually quite complementary because they are um, kind of increasing the size of the cake, if you like. And, you know, at a larger scale, if you think about um, Ed Glazer's work, who was at the last forum, uh, Future of the City uh, Symposium, and his book, Triumph of the City. I mean, what Ed would say is that uh, uh, virtual connections have made live connections much more important, and that if you look at where talented people are congregating, unfortunately for many cities, they are congregating in fewer and fewer places because smart people want to be with smart people, and the internet has, uh, you know, apparently accelerated that versus uh, uh, put that in reverse, which is what you might have expected to happen. Yeah, I mean, the two, two econo economic figures. One is, if, 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 if everything, I'm not saying virtual isn't important, it is, phenomenally, but the, it's actually amplified the importance yeah. of the physical, not reduced it. And two figures, one is, if, 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 if being really in contact with somebody is important, why does business cast flight cost so much? Yeah. And secondly, why does downtown real estate cost so much? Right. It's mm -hmm. people want to interact with each other. They have to do face to face. And the live performance is just another example of being part of an audience is somehow becoming part of what people value about an artistic experience. Uh, do we have time for one more question? Or would, Are we done? We good? Uh, we'll take another question. Hi, um, I'm Barbara Cannon with the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events. My question is um, initially directed towards Alan. You mentioned um, that one of the decisions that was made in terms of the music industry was support the musicians and build the venues. And I wondered if you could expand a little bit upon what is supporting the performers. What do you mean by support? Oh my God. I'm, I'm amazed how many questions about which I know nothing people ask me. Um, <laughs> I, I, can, I can tell you what I, what I can talk about is the lobbies I encounter and the lobbies you encounter all about what can you do to facilitate a young musician making a career by actually making an income. That's what I am told. And there are two obstacles. They say, one, they need the audiences. And that boils down to extraordinary micro thing in London, which is entertainment licenses. The biggest issue actually is a change in the entertainment licensing so that cafes can stage live music because at present they're not allowed to. So tiny little things can make the difference. So rather than give you a big theory of how to support performers, all I can say is as an economist I include you've got, I conclude you have to. And you have to support your artists. But the way to find out how to do it is to ask them. Great. Can I just add a couple of things to that? One, one is that we had a big battle about unemployment benefit, didn't we? Yeah. Um, because it was realized that most bands in their very early stages, they need money to live on. And the government was threatening to get rid of unemployment benefit for them. So but actually, it has stayed in place. The other thing is that when I was doing some research up in Newcastle, I heard a story I'm, I'm sure it is true, that uh, back in the good old days, um, you used to be able to go to your local authority in the UK and ask for them to buy an amplifier. And that's how Sting got started off. It was Middlesbrough Town Council who bought him an amplifier oh, wow. and he played in the village hall. 
Well, I, I have to wrap up the session, and I want to thank our speakers. If we can please have a round of applause for them.